The scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Uh, Let us stand this morning for the reading of God's word. Writer of the Hebrews says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time that we have this morning to come together, lift up our voices in song to you in praise, and to study your word together. We thank you, Father, for this wonderful book you've given to us and for the indwelling Holy Spirit. We pray that as we study this morning, we'll allow the Holy Spirit to use your word in our hearts and in our lives, knowing that he has the ability, gives us the power to take the words from the page and to put them into practice in our daily life. We ask all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There's a legendary tale about the uh, late Bear Bryant who coached at Texas A&M before he took the head coaching job at the University of Alabama. In a game against Alabama in 1957 in Alabama, Texas was actually winning late in the game. Bryant told the quarterback, Roddy Osborne, under no circumstances was he to pass the ball. Just run the ball, and if it came to fourth down, then punt it away. It was a, it was a tight game, a slow scoring game of field position. Roddy also happened to be the punter. Well, what happened? Against all instructions, Roddy actually passed the ball to an open receiver. Only problem was, he wasn't quite so open. A defender came darting out of nowhere and intercepted the ball. That player's name was Donnie Stone, the fastest player on Alabama's team. And he had nothing between him and the end zone but open field. However, Roddy, one of the slowest guys on the A&M, A&M team at the time, actually caught Donnie, run him down, and tackled him. A&M held on to the lead and won the game. After the game, Bryant was asked how Osborne could possibly have caught up to Stone and tackled him, to which Bryant re- replied, well, Stone was running for a touchdown, but Osborne was running for his life. <laughs> Discipline can be a scary thing, can it? No one likes to suffer discipline. Not a college football player, not a little kid, hey, not even us as full-grown, full-age adults do we like discipline even now. It's not pleasant. You know, as the children of God, we should also fear God's discipline. The writer of the Hebrews is going to talk more about God's discipline in the passage we're going to look at next week. But in this passage before us today, the writer is actually calling for us to discipline ourselves so that God's discipline is not necessary. First of all, the writer challenges us to take a stand. Oh, I had a a remote here somewhere. There it is. The writer challenges us to take a stand in verse 1. He says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. The NIV renders it this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses. Uh, Various translations, they render it wherefore or therefore. And that points backward to what we looked at last week in chapter 11. It's modified by the phrase, the cloud of witnesses, or we would say a a crowd of witnesses, which were presented in that passage that we looked at. A lot of people call that, Hebrews chapter 11, they call that the great hall of faith, as opposed to the hall of fame. I guess it could be the hall of fame as God's children, the great hall of faith. Don't get the wrong idea, though, about what the author is saying about these witnesses when he says, seeing that we're surrounded by, by such a cloud of witnesses or, or a crowd of witnesses. It not, it's not like they're spectators and we're in a stadium and they're all watching us. That's not the idea. It, it's not to be rendered since there are so, so many great men and women watching us. 
That's not the idea of the passage here. It would be more like, since we have so many faithful examples of those who lived by faith, trusting in God's promises. You see, their life is a witness to us. The way that they lived. That's what we studied whole chapter of 11 last week. How these people took a stand of faith, trusting in God's promises. We are to study the men and women of faith who have gone before. These are people of faith who bear witness to the grace and power of our living God. Let their lives instruct us and inspire us so that we also can remain faithful to Jesus Christ even when life gets hard. Like them, let us take our stand of faith. But how easy is that? We have that phrase, that, that old expression, that's easier said than done. Oh yes, we know. While we're here on this earth, in these bodies of flesh that are corrupted with a sinful nature, living the Christian life, walking a spiritual walk is tough. We know it's a struggle. You know, as we looked back last week in chapter 11 at all of those examples of lives lived by faith, we could also go back in the scriptures for many, if not most of them, and find their struggles where they struggled, and we know it's true with us. The writer says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The Christian life here is described as a race. It's described as running. Let us run this race. I, I put on a little bit of weight, I know you've been kind. You haven't said how many Dr. Peppers I've been drinking or that I need to lay off. I know I need to lose some weight. Lately, anytime I hear the word run, my pulse quickens, my, my breathing picks up pace, my calves start to twitch, and I think, what's on TV right now? <laughs> For most of us, running just doesn't sound like a fun thing to do. There are some people that they love to run. I think something's wrong with them. That's just... <laughs> That's not from the Word of God. That's just me personally. Running can be good for us, though, right? I mean, I see friends on Facebook, social media, posting that day how many miles they ran. I tried it the other day. I actually went out and ran three-tenths of a mile. <laughs> the Apostle Paul, in his writings, also likened the spiritual walk the, the Christian life that we are called to live as a race that is to be run. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24, the Apostle Paul said, Do you not know that all that run in a race run? All the runners run, but only one gets the prize. And he said, Run in such a way as to get the prize. Like, run in such a way that there's only one prize to be given. That's the way we are challenged to live our Christian life, to live a faithful life, a life of faith that is such a great testimony that our lives speak of God and our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, more so than the other people around us. Now, that's not we're called to compare ourselves to one another. That's not at all what the Apostle Paul was saying. He's just challenging you personally to live your life that way, to have that much faith in God and the way that you live your life that you are a shining example of how it's to be done. The writer here in Hebrew says, let us run with endurance the race that's laid out before us. God has laid out a course, a race for every believer in our life. Your race is not mine. Mine's not yours. Uh, we all have this race that we are to run, this Christian walk, this life of faith, but when it comes down to what we are to do in our life, each individual has their own unique path that God has set out for them. We're not all called to do the same thing. We, we're not all given the same gift by the Holy Spirit of God to serve the body of Christ. But whatever your gift is, you are called to use it. 
to run this race, your race, whatever it is that God has laid out for you, so that in the end, you will have persevered. It will be said of you that you finished your particular race well. He says, run with patience. Run with endurance. In other words, this isn't a quick thing. This isn't the 40-yard dash, keeping the sports analogy that runs all through this. This is something that we're in for for the long haul, this Christian walk, this life of faith. Run it with endurance. The picture is that of an athletic contest, much like the Olympic Games. We were to go back to 1 Corinthians 9. Paul said more than just about a runner there. He also talked about a boxer. And here again, it's a runner. There's a course that's been laid out. These Hebrews that he's writing to, they were the contestants in this race. They could see the formidable length of the course that lay ahead of them. The obstacles that were in their way, the hindrances, the steep grades all along the way, and many of them were ready to withdraw from that race. And the writer writes to them to encourage them, to challenge them not to do that, to continue on, to run their race, even though, yes, it's a struggle. He encourages them to press on, to run with endurance. In the King James, it says, um, let us run with patience the race that's set before us. That phrase that's translated there, run with patience in the King James, it can also variously be translated to remain under or to bear up under. So you get the idea that there is some conflict there. There is the element of struggle. It does include some hardship and some suffering on our part. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29, the Apostle Paul said, For it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. We are called to suffer on behalf of Christ. So how do we do that? How do we run this race well in the struggle of life? The author gives us some pointers right away in that first verse. First of all, he says, let us lay aside the weights. Let us lay aside every weight. If someone's serious about going out for a run, what do they look like? I mean, how can you tell? If you see somebody wearing uh, big heavy steel toe boots and jeans and a, a thick overcoat, does that look like someone that's getting ready to go out and run to you? That, that person can run, they're just not going to be a very good runner with all of those things on them, weighing them down. You see, there's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves. But if you're going to run, we recognize automatically that's going to be a hindrance to that person's ability to run. In our Christian life, there are numerous and diverse things that can weigh us down. Non-essential items in our life that can take away from the things in our life that should be the essential things, such as our spiritual development. What are those hindrances? Well, I'm going to give you some examples, but I think deep down, each and every one of us today know what those weights are, what those things are that are weighing us down and holding us down, keeping us from running well. Maybe it's an unhealthy friendship. We need to have people in our lives that encourage our spiritual growth and development. Not people that discourage us and drag us down. Not people that sow discouragement, but people that sow encouragement. Maybe we're wearing a coat of idle entertainment as you run. That's a heavy coat. It'll weigh you down. It's games on your cell phone, Facebook, Twitter, the entire virtual world, football on TV. Hey, all of those things are okay. There's nothing wrong with those in and of themselves. It's when they get in the way of you doing something constructive that you should be doing with your life. Again, especially spiritual growth. Actually reaching out to other people. 
not just through social media, but in real human contact with other people, making a difference in their life. We can become too attached to those things and waste hours of our day. We live in a society where debt is just a given part of our existence. If you're going to buy a house, buy a car, most likely you're going into debt for that. But we also live in a society where people go into far too much debt for things that they really don't need. And then once you start servicing that debt, that takes up a whole lot of your time and energy, and then you don't have any resources left over to help out other people in need. I mean, it's a joy and a privilege. It's a great blessing to be able to reach out with a little bit, a little bit of finances to help somebody that's in need. But you're missing out on that blessing if you're having to work all the days of your life just to service your debt. That's a situation that you need to change if you can at all so you can experience that blessing of being able to help someone. Lay aside those weights. Shed all those things that weigh you down and slow you down. Get rid of the things that will keep you from doing your best in your Christian walk for God. So those are the weights. But he says, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, clings closely to us, tightly controls us, skillfully surrounds us. Those are other ways to render the original Greek language there. Isn't that the same thing as the weight? Well, not necessarily. We saw a moment ago, weights can be things that aren't bad in and of themselves. We just need to find a way to, to lay those aside, though, and not be so entangled in those. But sin, sin is a problem. Sin in our life, that's bad. There's no two ways about that. There's no middle ground. There's no walk in the fence. Sin is a bad thing in our life. And the King James here, as we read it, he says, and let us lay aside the sin which so easily besets us or controls us or entangles us. Is it sin in general or is there a specific sin that he's talking about? Is it sin, let us lay aside sin, or let us lay aside the sin? We can use it in either way, even when we're using the definite article to talk about the sin. If I say, all the sin out there in the world is a problem, you understand, I'm, even though I said the, I'm not just talking about one sin. I mean, I'm talking about all sin in the world. That's a problem. We know it's true in general, and we know how sins can entangle us, beset us, as it's rendered in the King James, surround us, control us, and how damaging it can be for us running well. Um, in the Greek, the specific article is there in front of the sin. The author really did say, and let us lay aside the sin, which does so easily beset us. If he wasn't talking in general, and he was talking about one particular sin, then I think the writer had in mind the particular sin of unbelief. Because last chapter, we saw all of these examples of faith, of lives of faith, people who lived by faith. When you have faith, when you believe, you can be certain of things that other people are not so certain about. When you believe, you can see things that other people cannot see. So plain to you what you see and what's happening around you, but others can't see that. You can hear things that others don't hear. You can know things that others don't know because of your belief. And because of all of that, you can also do what others cannot do if you truly believe, if you have faith, if you trust in God. When you believe God, you can run your race, your race well. But when you don't believe, man, if you, if you have the sin of unbelief in your life, it's going to be very easy for you to get tripped up, tangled, beset by the sins so that you stop moving forward and stop growing spiritually. The writer says, let us do this. Let us get rid of these weights. Let us set aside the weights and the sin. Get rid of it so we can run this race with patience, with endurance. 
that's set before us. Notice he says, let us do that. Do you hear the voluntary nature of it in there? Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses that show us what a life of faith can do, then let us also continue on. Get rid of weights and sins. There's a voluntary nature of this undertaking. God urges us to run the race, but he will not force you to do it. He won't. He urges us to, but you know, the choice is yours. It's your decision to make. But the thing is, if we really understand what God has done for us and what Jesus Christ did for us and has attained for us through the cross of Calvary, then we should want to do this. Amen? We should want to do this. We should be challenged by these examples that were set before us. That's what the writer's saying here. And here's the kicker. Listen to this part. The phrase translated, let us lay aside, is actually one word in the Greek, and it modifies both. Let us lay aside the weights, and the sins, which does so easily beset us. Let us lay aside. It's one word in the Greek, and that word is in the second aorist middle voice, and I'm sure you can understand why that's important. I'm kidding. I'm, don't, I know school was a long time ago. I don't even know if they still teach that th stuff in school anymore. But here's what it means. The writer is actually describing something that's already been done. When he says, let us lay aside the weights and the sins, it's in the second aorus middle voice, something that's already been done for us, the middle voice. Christ, because of his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, has already done this for you. Do you understand that? What we have to do then is just simply allow it to be true in our life. The work's already been done. How is that different, though? I mean, if it's totally voluntary for us to do it or if Christ has already done it. Listen, here's, here's how it's different. Because it's not a question of you or I having enough power to make this happen. Because God through his power, has already done it. Christ has already died on the cross for your sin, and all your sin was placed there. It's gone for a believer in Christ. It's been taken care of. It's simply a question of whether you're going to live like that or not. Whether you're going to allow that to be the case for you. Is it going to weigh you down or not? That choice is yours. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. You hear that? All that weight, the sin, the guilt. If you, all you that labor, you're trying to work, you're trying to earn, and you're heavy laden, I will give you what? Rest. Is there anything you have to do in order to attain to that rest? You just have to come to him. He's already taken care of it. Take my yoke upon you, he says, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The choice is yours. Seeing so many testimonies of faithfulness and God's promises with every weight and sin being laid aside, then let us run with patience this race that's been set before us. You see, it's at the root of it, it's not about us striving more or working harder. That's really not it. It's about us believing and having faith. Trusting in God. It's about us patiently waiting and enduring 
until this phase of our life is behind us. Paul said this light affliction is but for a moment. We just have to patiently endure it for the present. The striving's been done. The work is finished. We're just simply waiting on God in his timing to fulfill every promise he's made to us. That's what we're doing. We're called to be faithful in the meantime. That's the testimony of the hall of faith of Hebrews chapter 11. And it should be the testimony of our life as well. Oh, it's still going to be a struggle, and the writer knows that. But he also gives us some strategies for winning in this race. In verse 2, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus. That's in the present tense. It means it's something that we're to be continually doing all the time. Every moment of our life, every second of our day, continually, constantly looking at Jesus. And it doesn't just carry the meaning of looking at something. It also embodies the idea of looking away from other things. What are we typically most focused on? Anybody? Come on, throw it out there. What are we typically most focused on? This is an easy one. That's it. Me. Me. I'm continually focused on me. It's just who we are. It's our human nature. Me first. Look out for number one. But the writer says here, don't do that. Look away from yourself. Look to Jesus Christ. Look away from this world. Look to Jesus Christ. There's four areas here to help us in our spiritual focus as we look at Jesus Christ. And first of all, it's his person. He is described as the author and finisher of our faith. That word author there is variously rendered captain of our faith or leader of our faith. He, above all others, has been down this course that you're going down now. He's run this race of faith before in his earthly ministry. He knows how it should be run so what we should do is follow him. He's the captain. He's the leader of our faith. Follow him. He knows where all the pitfalls are, and he can help us avoid them because he's been there before. He can direct us each and every step of the way if we'll only let him. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Complete, finished, brought to maturity. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, He that began a good work in you, he will see it through. He will finish it. That verse can be rendered. Focus on Jesus. Gaze at the Savior. He started and finished this race of faith that you're in right now 2,000 years ago, and he did it perfectly. So we can follow him. And he understands what you're going through along the way. He knows the struggle you face. As we saw back in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, the author said he was tempted in all points just as we are. Therefore, he understands our infirmities. So when we're looking to Jesus, look to his person, who he is, what he did. He's the leader, the author, the finisher of this faith. And speaking of our infirmities, there's his passion. Uh, in this case, it means his suffering. Many of you probably have heard of or seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ. It means the suffering of the Christ. And we can think about his suffering. It says, he endured it, look at the verse, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The joy that was set before him there's actually some debate on how that should be translated from the Greek. Most render it for the joy that was set before him. Uh, Dr. Ernest Campbell and a couple of others insist that it's supposed to be rendered instead of the joy that was set before him. 
For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Or, instead of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You know, it, it really works out either way. If it's for the joy that was set before him, then what is the joy that was set before him? Why would he endure the cross for the joy that was set before him? We could give a, a long answer, but I'm going to give you the short answer this morning. It was the prospect of having unbroken fellowship with redeemed mankind. That was the joy that he was looking forward to. When our path of salvation would be finished, he's the finisher of our faith. And then we could come to him simply through what he had done. And we could have unbroken fellowship with him. And that's the joy that was set before him. Being the head over the church, over all things. What if it's supposed to be instead of the joy that was set before him? He endured the cross. Well, he was the son of God who left the glorious abode in heaven to come down take on the form of man, suffer humiliation, culminating in a shameful death on the cross of Calvary. You see, there it's instead of the joy of the heavenly existence that he had that was set before him, he left that behind to come to earth and suffer humiliation on the cross of Calvary, despising the shame. Um, in other words, not taking into account that it was a shameful death. But if we look at it from that viewpoint, why would he do that? If it's instead of the joy he came to earth and suffered all these things, why would he do all of that stuff? The answer is the same. For the prospect of having unbroken fellowship with mankind. So whether it's for the joy or instead of the joy, it's the same reason it comes down to the same thing the son of God co-equal with the father left the realms of heaven to come and take on human form suffer and die on the cross of Calvary so he could have fellowship with you insert your name here each and every one of you each and every one of us that's why he did it a Muslim who had converted to Christianity had a friend who didn't believe, and that troubled his heart, and he would talk to that friend often about it. But that friend couldn't accept the idea that God would become a human being, and furthermore, born of a woman in such a dirty manner, coming to the earth in such a dirty manner, in a manger, and that God would take on this form and have to use the restroom, such as we do. I mean, all of those things just sound disgusting. They're a natural part of our human existence, but for a glorious God to come and voluntarily suffer such disgusting things, aren't all of these things beneath God? Well, he knew that the friend had a daughter. So he said, let's say that you're on your way to an important ceremony in your finest clothes and you see your daughter drowning in a pool of mud, what will you do? Will you let her drown so that you can continue to look dignified? Will you try to call for someone else to save her? Or would you jump in yourself and rescue her even though it meant you would arrive at the ceremony covered in mud? And the friend said, she is my child. Of course I won't let her drown or call for someone else. I will jump in the mud and I will save her myself. And he said, if you being a human love your daughter so much that you are willing to lay aside your dignity to save her, how much more can we expect God, our loving Father, to lay aside his majesty to come and save us? What a wonderful illustration. God's willingness to despise the shame of becoming a man and endure the cross won over his friend that day who finally understood God's love. I hope you do too. I hope you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
We need to look to him to run well, focus on his person, his passion, his suffering, and his position. The writer says at the end of verse 2 that he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He suffered the humiliation of becoming human, endured the cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, but guess what? That's not the end of the story. He rose again the third day and ascended into heaven. Marines train for assaults, specific group of them, commandos. The theory of the commando raid is that it has to capture the element of surprise, done as quickly and as silently as possible on the area where there is the least defenses. That's where the point of attack is least expected. And most often, that is near a cliff. You know how they do it. They come up to the cliff, they shoot a grapnel hook up on top of it with, with a rope, a line, and then they pull on that until it snags on something up there, and then one person will climb up that rope with a heavier rope trailing behind them. But one Marine will climb up that rope, get to the top, fasten the heavier rope to something secure, and then give the rope two tugs. And that means for everyone else below, when they feel those two tugs, that they can all pile on that rope and climb up so that they can make the assault. That's the picture of what we have here in Jesus Christ in Hebrews 12 too. He's the founder and finisher of our faith. He blazed the trail all the way to the top, and he invites us to follow him with full confidence, totally secure in the path that he's opened up for us. Because Jesus opened up the way, you too can endure your cross with confidence, whatever it is, whatever your path of suffering is that God has laid out for you. You can bear whatever the shame is all the way to the joy that awaits and our heavenly reward. If you want to finish your life well, look to Jesus as the Savior and also look to him as, their, as our example. Finally, his pattern in verse 3 says, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners. In other words, they, they talked against him, against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Consider him. Literally, that means to consider well or to carefully consider, to truly think about it, to really ponder it. What Jesus Christ went through. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, we have the picture of the cross. A couple of times now, the writer has mentioned the shame endured on the cross, how he suffered. In Isaiah chapter 53, starting with verse 4, the Holy Spirit speaking through Isaiah here says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, that is on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He suffered so much. Shame and reproach, even the shameful death of a criminal's cross, but it would not stop him. It would not. His love for us was too great. There's a similar passage in Philippians chapter 2. Turn with me there. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 5. There was some contention in the church at Philippi and the people needed to be a little more humble. We'll consider how humble the Lord Jesus Christ was to leave his glorious abode in heaven to come down and take upon himself the form of a human. So Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, Let this mind be in you which also is in Christ Jesus, a mind of humbleness, 
who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. A shameful, humiliating death, but he endured it. And we are called to do the same. We are called to endure whatever life throws at us. Suffering, affliction, trial, pain, sorrow. Endure it with faith, just as the Lord Jesus Christ did. He is our pattern that we are to follow. American Joey Lee entered a 150-mile marathon that would stretch over seven days across the Sahara Desert in Morocco. By day four, many runners had given up. Some had even been airlifted out, overcome by the heat and physical exhaustion. On that very day, day four, Joey's shoes got so hot that the air pockets in the soles blew out, giving him no more cushion as he ran, but he pressed on with blistered feet, eyes burning from the sand and the sweat, temperatures over 100 degrees. Joey was exhausted, but he still pressed on. And at the end of the seventh day, he finished the race. Despite the physical toll that it took on his body, he endured, he pressed through. Because you see, Joey was running the race in honor of his wife, who a little over a year before that had died of cancer. After that, he was asked how he was able to keep going under such hardship. And he replied, I just thought of my wife, Allison, and I told myself that this is nothing compared to what she went through. The suffering of our Savior should be just as real to us. Whatever we're going through, it's nothing compared to what Jesus Christ endured for us. It's nothing compared to the shame that he suffered. The glorious God of creation being spat upon and beaten by those he created. Suffering a shameful death on the cross of Calvary. The writer says to keep this in mind, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. Or it can be rendered, lest you become tired, exhausted, and therefore become discouraged. We are to set our eyes on Jesus Christ. What he did for us, what he endured on our behalf. How he never wavered. And is right now at the right hand of God waiting for us. He's blazed the trail, and our path in him is safe and secure. In that, we can be encouraged, invigorated. Let us be able to say with the Apostle Paul, who said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. See, there's that race again. The course laid out before us. I have kept the faith. I'll close with the words that you sang just a bit ago. The words of Helen Lamell, who also wrote the music for it. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much again for this time that we've had this morning. We thank you and praise you with words that we can't muster. But we know, Father, you feel the joy in our heart for your plan of salvation and the faithfulness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for these glimpses of lives of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and all throughout the scriptures. And also, Father, those that we've known personally in our own lives, 
who lived lives of unwavering faith. We are challenged by them. We just pray that we do heed the challenge from the Holy Spirit in our daily life and the power that he strives to give to us if we will only accept it to lay aside the weights and distractions and cares and concerns that can weigh us down, and most of all, the sin which so much displeases you. We pray that we listen to his guidance and not grieve him as he follows us in our daily life. Father, we're thankful, so grateful, so humbled that you use us just pray that the magnitude of that truly impacts our heart as it should, that we are the ambassador of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are your children who have been called to give testimony to your love in the world around us. I just pray, Father, that our lives prove that out to be true for your glory and for the sake of the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.